Two Set Violin are two boys from Brisbane, brilliant violinists, incredibly funny people who are giving classical music a long overdue kick up the rear. Oh, come on, left, turn left, the first dressing room. We are in the midst of the world tour right now. We're doing 10 cities in the USA. We would have never imagined 10 years ago that we would be able to do these big world tours, um, selling out these big concert halls. I don't have my proper blender, so I'm just using tissue. We're in the David Geffen Hall in Lincoln Centre. It's in New York. We're about 30 minutes away from the show. I'm super excited. The warm-up kind of consists of just panic practice. <laughs> Anything that we feel like needs a bit more work last minute. Five minutes. Normally in a classical music concert, it's like a sea of white hair. Hi. Uh, and our audience is kind of the opposite, actually. Now it's people that have never heard classical music before. Their celebrity status is epic. Top of their game classical musicians uh, would be green with envy as to their reach. You know, millions of subscribers and billions of views. Are you ready for the two set workout? Down bow, up bow, down bow, up bow. I don't think anyone really believed that being a YouTuber was even an option, let alone, you know, violin comedy. but they decided they wanted to forge their own path. You know, they've put everything on the line, really, given up everything they know, and nothing's really stopped them since. Normally, when you walk on the stage class music concert, it's just <laughs> silence. You bow, you tune silence, and it's the pressure's on. Before I begin, <laughs> who here has heard of a game called Violin Charades? We're not deliberately setting out to break the rules like a rebellious teenager. Our mission is kind of to be that gateway that brings people into the world of classical music in a more fun, relaxed, entertaining way. They are very good violinists. You can't use humor about a very specific craft unless you know everything about it. <laughs> It just wouldn't work. This is something that we didn't intentionally plan to do, but it was very obvious that it became our purpose and it's something we felt really comfortable doing too. I tell my past self like, thanks for taking the risk and just going for it. And whatever happens, you're gonna have a ride of your lifetime. I was born in Taipei, Taiwan, and when I was 12, my whole family moved to Australia. My first thought was spiders, snakes, uh, all the insects and bugs that could kill you. Brett started violin when he was five years old, yeah, and he loved the violin. But I always encourage him and bring him to see the orchestra and to join the music camp. And we always educate children, you need to survive in, in Australia. <laughs> we, don't, we are not a rich family, we are very ordinary, like everybody else. So you need to, to be uh, strong, stronger than the other people. So this is the room where my mom placed everything together. I would never do something like this. Uh, this when was this, 2008? 
Senior Strings Championship. So this was kind of my set with phase. I think practice, ironically, really made me love music. <laughs> yeah, because I also think if it was too easy, I may not have appreciated as much. Um, down here, I actually have my, uh, the very first violin that I played on, so. It really comforted me knowing that if you just practice in the right way, without a doubt, you will get the results you want. I was also born in Taiwan, and then we came to Australia when I was eight. <laughs> my mom thought it would be better for me and my sister's future. Ah, look, at you. you are so cute, so young. <laughs> Only maybe 10 years. I actually started the piano first when I was five years old, and I started learning the violin when I was six. When I first started playing, I hated practicing. My mom was the one who really forced me to keep practicing. Uh, I don't uh, hush to you. I always very kind. Of course. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, tough love. I remember when I was young, she put a timer on the piano and said, "If you don't practice 30 minutes, you can't eat dinner tonight." Me and Eddie were both really dedicated. I could always hear his violin. Um, which was really loud when we were, you know, children, and I was like, oh, he's practicing again. It's like, you know, violin's quite piercing. Let me so this is the report card from grade seven. I demonstrated everything except for life skills. <laughs> no life skills, but everything else was good. When I was around 12, 13, I really started to fall in love with classical music. I discovered a CD recording of popular classical music like Debussy. It just really clicked with me and resonated and I found myself so deeply curious and intrigued and I wanted to explore more. I accompanied him when he was doing his auditions, when he was doing his competitions, his statements, um, lessons as well. I was involuntarily his pianist for like the entire childhood. Oh wow, I'm doing so bad. I actually met Brett in maths tutoring. <laughs> it's not music related at all and it's like the most Asian possible way to meet. And you know, it was like a three hour maths tutor, a tutoring class on a Friday evening. And no one wants to go tutoring on a Friday evening. Whoa, I'm catching up. Oh damn, you're actually getting kind of close. And I, we just started talking at the back of the class. Like, oh, I, somehow we got onto the topic of playing violin. It's like, oh, you play violin? Oh, me too, I play the violin. Next day, we had the Queensland Youth uh, Symphony Orchestra. And then I just hear kind of down 10 meters away, it's like, hey, it's you from mass tutoring. I look up and it was Brett. And since then we became good friends, yeah. By the time I was 15, 16, I really started considering possibly doing music as a career. And then my mum kind of did the 180 where she's like, you should stop practicing so much. You should study more because you, you know, you're going to become a doctor, right? I feel like for my mum and my father, they came from backgrounds where their parents couldn't offer them the same things they were offering us. And so I think there was a natural instinct for them to want to make sure the kids are going to be okay and they're going to make the right choices. I knew I wanted to do music when I was around year 11, year 12. I just couldn't imagine myself being in office all day. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> music as a your career, we hardly really worry about your future because you know, it's you need to to be a very, very, very good. Like uh, America got the talent, Australia got the talent. But once he decide, we are support him. That's very important. After high school, we studied at the Queensland Conservatory of Music, uh, majored in violin. Brett and Eddie were two of our 
brightest and best students. You can hear the sax, the loudest instrument. They wanted to do well and excel in everything. Good to Hello. see you. Come on in. <laughs> Yay. Oh, wow, there's a new couch. And they wanted to come out the best possible musician they could be. The thing that surprised me the most is that, don't take this the wrong way, I never found you that funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, I mean, we yeah. took our lessons very seriously. Know, yeah. like, we took practicing very seriously. Both Brett and yeah, Eddie yeah. came in hoping to be soloists. I think that's the dream that many people have. Usually soloists are like the top 1% of performers. Um, it's not just top 1%, it's like the 1% of the 1% that gets to have a solo career. When you're young and you don't know where your limits are, it's, it is, in my opinion, a good and beautiful thing to dream big and be optimistic. But I can see in other ways it manifests in kind of an unhealthy fear of imperfection. And I myself went through this. Because I wasn't processing that stress, because I was kind of just like, no, just practice more. The answer to everything is practice more. Because <laughs> I don't think I realised how much of a kind of obsessive state I had gone into during that time, yeah. When I was 20, I actually started developing pain. First in my right arm, I remember here. It was difficult because he had this big competition and he also was going to play a concerto at the conservatorium with the orchestra. So there was a lot of pressure on him at the time. And he was doing all the right things and suddenly it seemed to progress from one arm to the other and it was getting very, very worrying. And then that same pain sensation spread to my legs and that's when I really freaked out and panicked. Even to this day, thinking about it, it feels so unreal. Like he was in a wheelchair. He couldn't move. So the neurologist told me what you have is essentially a psychosomatic pain. It is um, a type of pain where there's no real physical injury in your body, but the pain sensations you're feeling is very real. And so he said, I just need to push through the pain, but keep telling myself that it's normal and it's fine. It was the scariest thing for me to do. But you know, at that point, I feel like I had not much left to lose. So I was willing to try anything. And I was shocked that within two days, I was able to walk. I remember it was crazy. I still remember you messaging me. He's like, I can walk. I'm like, what do you mean you can walk? The neurologist said, in my case, it was probably triggered by emotional stress. And I, I realized part of that, perhaps looking back, was because I had gone against my mom's wishes um, to be a doctor, I really felt that I needed to prove myself and make it as a musician. I truly know that my mom had only the best intentions for me and she loves me so much. Um, but that, I guess, was really digging away at me beneath the surface. It kind of started that journey of self-reflection for me. And it was such a pivotal point in my psychology and my relationship with music. The other day, someone asked me to describe my editing process. In the early stages when I got sick, I kind of took in video editing just as a hobby. I'd be watching YouTube tutorials. It was around the time where Gundam Star was the first video to hit 1 billion views. And we saw this, we whoa, no way. We should make videos, this seems so cool. Uh, and that was when we first started experimenting with videos. In the beginning, we were just exploring. We were having fun. It's like a kid with a new toy. It was just so cringy. I can't look at it anymore. <laughs> when we graduated from the university, I went to the Sydney Symphony Orchestra and Eddie stayed in Brisbane to play with the Queensland Symphony Orchestra. And during that time, Eddie and I were separated in different cities. Uh, that didn't stop us. We still kept making videos. And these skits were drawn from our experiences as a classical musician. And the very first one that went viral was this video where I imitated a violinist dancing. 
We didn't realize that there were so many musicians out there that share the same experiences. Going through the exams, going through auditions, going through competitions as a musician, the nerves, all the practicing we have to do. We were being relatable. I saw the videos coming out, the views creeping up. I kind of thought, oh wow, they're really serious about this. Around that time, Eddie joined um, a national violin competition. He got into the semi-finals. I wanted to keep growing and keep pushing my potential. I think that's why I was still doing competitions, even though I had the job. And I didn't get through to the finals, and that's fine. But I remember what really bothered me was the adjudicator's feedback. One of the lines was just, not enough eye contact with the pianist. To me, that felt like such a trivial point to judge a musician on. And that is supposedly meant to decide your career as a violinist. We worked so hard, we practiced so hard, but just the system was very harsh. And that's when he had the realization that, you know what, I'm gonna stop letting other people dictate what my career is gonna be like. I'm gonna to have to take it into my own hands. And I remember Eddie messaged me, he goes, Brett, I booked uh, a concert hall. We're gonna do a concert. I was like, oh, oh wow, it's serious now. Thank you very much. What's this? They wanna play like Paganini? <laughs> we wanted our concert to, you know, carry the same spirit as our online content, but it was just how to translate 30 second short videos into a 90 minute concert. We had no idea how to do that. Yeah. Oh, I, feel, I feel this amazing power of surging through me. Like, yeah, what is it? I don't know, like, uh... <laughs> That's Paganini! No way! Whoa! I can do this. You can play jingle bells now. Oh. <laughs> When they did their first concert, um, I really didn't know what to expect. I had a feeling that I would probably be shrinking and cringing a bit, and that was not the case. <laughs> I wasn't sure if their concert was going to be more of a concert or more of the comedy aspect. But it was the perfect combination of both. And yeah, it was a hit, everyone loved it, and I think from that moment, they got a taste of what it's like to actually get that feedback and get that reaction. And so we took the leap of faith and we both quit our jobs in orchestra and tried to commit full time to YouTube. another episode of Two Step Violin. When Eddie and Brett decided to become YouTubers, I wasn't surprised because I feel like my brother is of such a character that if he wanted to do something, he'll make it happen. My mother was slightly concerned, uh, just probably out of like fear, like, is he going to be okay? This it just didn't make sense to me. I thought, well, how are you going to make money out of doing these video recordings? We are asking for your help to help us become the very first crowdfunded classical music world tour. They came up with this idea of a world tour that could be crowdfunded. Again, another crazy idea I didn't think was going to be possible. So we decided for us to raise money for our tour, we're going to do a busking marathon. This is Pitt Street Mall, Kai If you're in Sydney, come Pitt Street Mall. We're going to busk non-stop. <laughs> and we're gonna sleep outside. And we had to keep doing it until we reach our funding goal of $50,000. Thinking back at it again, this was just young, hot-headed naivety. Your turn. We were so lucky we actually hit our funding goal within five days, because I don't think we would have lasted physically much longer. So that initial amount of money covered a few cities. And the ticket sales we made from that went to the next few cities. Hey guys, this is it's like day seven in London. No one knew this. 
we just promised we're gonna go to these 10 cities, but we didn't know if we could even really make it. It was just really fun and it opened up a lot of opportunities for us as we were able to meet different people. Uh, that's how we met Hillary, is because of the First World Tour. Hilary Hahn is one of the most legendary violinists today. When I met them back in, I guess, 2018, I think we were fangirling, fanboying, kind of, and then we got that energy out and just started having conversation. We convinced her to shoot a video with us doing a Ling Ling workout. Ling Ling is this fictional character that represents all the ideals of the perfect prodigy. Uh, something you'll never attain and something that your parents will always compare you to. Not like Ling Ling, who practiced 40 hours a day and become doctor at age five. And the Ling Ling workout is a series of challenges that are kind of ridiculous. <laughs> that are kind of impossible. What do you think about this combo? I think that would be pretty good. Oh! <laughs> We never thought someone like Hillary would do this. And it was one of the most unbelievable things that happened here. Mm. The fans were shocked, but also really excited in a good way. I think that video has brought a lot of people into classical music because it's, it's so wacky, but it's also so interesting. It's just fun. It's fun for everyone. So last year in 2022, uh, Hillary was doing a concert in Sydney. And so we really wanted to go watch her perform live. And then she, she messaged and reached out, hey, I was thinking maybe you would like to jump on stage with me for the encore. I don't know, I was, I was thinking, well, we can't say no. <laughs> no <laughs> <laughs> I'm lucky enough to work sometimes in their zone, and I wanted to invite them into my zone. If you told 18-year-old me, who was still very optimistic about being a soloist, that you would one day share the stage with Hilary Hahn, he would have been like, get out of here, you know? The audience looked at them a certain way when they came out because they know them from the videos that they make. But by the end, I felt like the audience saw them as performing violinists. I'm fine, fine, yeah. The Morgan, don't touch my organ. It was about two years ago. Eddie approached me with an idea to make K-pop, but classical. K-pop is a genre of pop music, obviously originated from Korea. It's always very bright, very bouncy. And so we came up with this idea that these five composers decided to form a modern day pop boy group. B to the SM. In your era. B to the SM is an acronym for Bach, Beethoven, Tchaikovsky, Shostakovich, and Mozart. And it was really fun kind of mixing in different iconic works on each composer and like kind of weaving that into like a pop format. During that song, we also had a little cameo from Paganini. Paganini was an Italian violinist who was so good at the violin that people believed he might have sold his soul to the devil in exchange for his violin skills. So we were working on a follow-up piece for B to the SM, and then along comes a K-pop group called Blackpink who released a track called Shutdown, and in it they sampled La Campanella by Paganini. In the K-pop world, with these super groups like Blackpink, we are talking tens of millions of followers, and they're not just followers, they're super fans, super bands with super fans. They will die on the hill for you. 
In the shutdown piece, the violin line and La Campanella just repeat the whole way through, no variations. Black pink in your area. What black pink do is incredible. But just from a classical music standpoint, we just felt like there could have been more to it than just that one or two bars. And we thought, okay, why don't we get Paganini to react to their video? I wrote the entire La Campanella, entire concerto. Why you the entire time and you only use the two bars? And to follow that up, we decided to go, well, why don't we try to make a music video out of this? I sold my soul to the devil. You sold your to your label. It was a cheeky parody, but I think it was really well intentioned. Honestly, at the beginning when we posted the video, we thought, you know, there might be a bit of backlash, but it won't be that bad, right? Classical musicians understand what we're trying to say. For the first 12 hours, I was like, oh, there was no hate at all. And then the next morning I woke up and it just went ballistic. So it's been a year. Let's see uh, if we can find the comments from a year ago. Yeah, and I said, I hope you break your fingers and never play music again. And it just created this massive K-pop feud. And I think, you know, in probably an unfunny way, it was an example of two set getting seriously trolled, you know, by die-hard Blackpink fans. Do you know how to sing? Your voice is the ugliest thing I've ever known. During that frenzy, they started spamming everything. All our channels, like YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter. They were basically berating not just us on comments, but anyone they thought were vaguely associated to us. The Singable Symphony Orchestra has been flamed on social media by Blackpink fans. Some of the unhappy K-pop fans try to cancel a really important concert that we were going to do with the Singapore Symphony Orchestra. It was the celebration of achieving 4 million YouTube subscribers on our channel. Actually, I remember we were a little bit worried when that first happened. So that was really nerve wracking. Thankfully, the Blackpink and Paganini drama died down and the concert went ahead. This concert, this was a very special moment. I played the Mendelssohn Violin Concerto. It was kind of that moment when I realised that dream I had as a kid did come true for that moment in time, playing a notable concerto with a professional orchestra. We are very proud of Brad and AD. They do a very good job. Yeah. People love it. No matter where you are eight years old or you are 80 years old, they all love it to see uh, what a ordinary boy, two boy, play such beautiful violin. At the end of the concert, I played uh, La Campanella Paganini as a special encore, <laughs> which was fun. We're going to play La Campanella with more than two bars. Eddie Chan. One of the really cool things with two set for us was being able to see that, hey, you can make it and grow an audience and tour around the world to thousands of people, but not have to go through this kind of very highly competitive, streamlined, traditional path that they have laid it out for you. Um, I mean, still massive respect for people that do make it through that way, um, but I think it's really cool just to um, know that there are other options. I feel like we're both very grateful, and I guess it's just, I'm really glad it paid off. Yeah, we're very lucky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>